Hello and welcome back. Now in my previous two videos I looked at how other people build low noise signal amplifiers. And then I started simulating my own version using LD Spice. And today I'm going to show you the product of those simulations. This thing. So it's small, it's compact, it's battery powered and if you're curious about how well this thing actually works then keep watching. So let's start off by looking at the schematic. On the bottom side we can see the actual amplifier part. So this is basically the same circuit that we've seen in the previous video being simulated using LT Spice. Only difference being that I added this trimmer here instead of the 100 ohm resistor and the purpose of this is to be able to fine tune the gain. So all the components have a certain tolerance and by using this variable resistor you can actually fine tune the gain to get exactly 60 decibels. Other than that added filtering capacitors and then on the top side I have an extra dual op amp. So the bottom one was the AD8676 and then on top I'm using the LM833 and the reason why I added this op amp is first of all to create a ground reference that is the middle of the supply voltage. So I don't want to use a ton of 1.5 volt batteries. I ended up using a single 9 volt battery. So that way it managed to fit inside this little box. So there's a little 9 volt battery in there. And to get my differential supply, so plus minus 4.5, I added this little circuit. So this is a, an op amp set in a voltage follower configuration and it's basically outputting me half the supply voltage. Now the second half of the op amp I've used to create a crude battery level indication circuit. So I have a 3.9 volt Zener reference and I'm comparing this to the ground. Which if we reference this to the ground of the op amp will be half of the supply voltage. So half of 9 volts is 4.5 and as long as this voltage is larger than the 3.9 on the Zener diode we have our green LED lit. When the battery discharges and half of its voltage is less than 3.9 then the red LED will turn on. So that's why I have these two LEDs here just to show you if the battery is okay or not. And of course there's a switch here so that you can turn it off so you don't drain the battery. So moving on, let's see what's inside of this thing. So what I did, I used a standard aluminum casing so you can get these things quite cheaply. And then the entire circuitry is built on this PCB. So if I remove it. Now before moving inside, here on the PCB we can see the input connector and the output connector. I used an SMA input connector and B and C output. They could have both been B and C or SMA. I just chose these because uh, I like them. They, they look nice. I mean this is golden, this is shiny and silvery. Then we can see the two LEDs and the on off switch. And when the unit is on, the green LED turns on. And when the battery discharges, the red LED will turn on. So inside of this pretty basic we can see the battery, 9 volt battery inside of a plastic holder. I just glued this in place with some hot glue. And then the entire circuitry simply fits on the back side of the PCB. So because the circuit is quite simple, you can get everything on quite a small PCB with a lot of room to spare. Now you may notice these three holes. These are there because Initially I planned to put the battery holder directly on the PCB but that didn't really work out. So quite a simple, quite basic construction and usually the simpler a thing is, the better it works. Next thing to do will be to calibrate this thing to make sure that the gain is precisely set. And for that I prepared this quite extensive setup here. So let me walk you through it. What I got here is a signal coming from the signal generator. So we can see this directly connected to the first channel. It's a roughly 400 millivolt peak to peak signal. 
And at the same time, I'm also passing it through this little board that is a voltage divider that divides by 100. So it's a 10 kilo ohm resistor with something around 100 ohms. Now afterwards, I'm passing this into my board directly. And here I have an extra 100 ohm resistor. So basically what I'm doing here is dividing my input signal by 200. Then the board is supposed to amplify it by around 1000, so 60 decibels. So dividing by 200, amplifying by 1000 leads to an amplification of 5. And that I'm going to be measuring through the second cable that goes into the second channel. So what I want to see here is my 400 millivolt signal amplified by 5. So first divided by 200, then amplified by 1000, so total of total gain of 5. So a 2 volt signal coming out. So if we turn this thing on, we see that there's a bit of noise on the blue signal. So that's coming from the signal generator. It's not the circuit itself. We'll be measuring its noise later. And now I can take my small screwdriver to this variable resistor that I added to set the gain. And we can fine tune this so that the output signal is as close as possible to five times that of the input signal. So something like this. So now that it's calibrated, we can reassemble the circuit and move on to the next thing. That being measuring the output noise of the amplifier. So what I got here is the amplifier by itself connected to the second channel of the oscilloscope and we have nothing connected on the input. And now if we zoom in a bit, we start to see some noise, so it's not a perfect circuit. But what we're seeing is around 8.7 millivolts peak to peak or 1.44 millivolts RMS. Now, if we remember from the simulation, that was predicting a 1.5 millivolt RMS of output noise. So surprisingly, the noise of the practical circuit is dead on with what we're expecting from the simulation, which is great. Now, you may think that 8.7 millivolts is a lot of noise, but if we consider this from the input point, if we divide this by a thousand, that means that we can measure signals above 10 microvolts. So anything that's in the order of a few dozen microvolts, 100 microvolts, we will be able to clearly see it using this amplifier. Now, another thing we can do is add a termination resistor, so not leaving the input floating. And if we do this, the noise will decrease a bit. So the smaller the load on the input, the less noise the circuit will see. Now, this circuit has been built with the AD8676, but previously I also tried out the LM833. And that has more noise, as you can see in this oscillogram, but it's not unusably large. So if you don't have this particular AD component available, you can also try that alternative. So now that we know that the circuit works, works quite decently, it's calibrated, we can finally move on to make some measurements. So to try out some sort of circuit, see how well it actually performs. And for that, I went out and bought this, a cookie box. And not just any cookie box, but butter cookies. So it's not a Christmas cookie box that's filled with joy and cheer and bleh, like one of you guys correctly pointed out, it's simple and plain butter cookies. Now, on a serious note though, if you want to choose between one box and another to make a shielded enclosure, there are a few things you can watch out for. So first of all, the material from which the box is made. There are two main categories here, ferromagnetic materials and non-ferromagnetic. This case, my box is made from iron. So you can see that it's being attracted by the magnet. If the box would be made out of something else like aluminum, it wouldn't be as effective. So ferromagnetic materials are much better at shielding from electromagnetic waves. Second thing you can look out for is the thickness of the walls. So the thicker it is, 
the better. Another thing to consider is grounding it. So you don't just need a metallic box, you need to have it connected to ground or to earth ground. And speaking of earth ground, you need to make sure that the lid is actually connected to the rest of the box. Let me show you what I mean. So what I got here is my multimeter set to test continuity. And if we look inside of the box, there is continuity. But if I look on the outer rim, so this metallic part that seems shiny, there's some sort of varnish placed over it. So right now, if I would put my lid on it directly, it wouldn't make contact. It would be as if it's floating. So one of the important things will be to make sure that the entire case is making contact to all of the pieces. Next, you need to get your signal out of the box. And for that, a coaxial type of RF connector is recommended. So BNC, SMA or whatever type of connector you fancy, any of them will be good as long as you don't have any sort of exposed signal wire. And again, with this connector, you need to make sure that the casing is making contact with the box. So to have ground connected to ground. Now you can go a bit overboard and make a really, really good shielding enclosure. And in that case, one of the things you might add is ferrite sheets. So this is one of the things that is available on the market at the moment. It's quite expensive, but you can buy it. And simply line the inside of the box with this sort of material. And that will help with absorbing any sort of outside electromagnetic waves, but especially waves generated inside. So to prevent any sort of reflections. Another thing you can do is create a Russian doll type of design. So a matryoshka. Basically what that means is create multiple layers inside of the box. So just like we've seen in the linear technology application node, where they used three layers made from different materials, each having their own special properties. So now that we have the box covered, let's make an actual measurement. And for that, I prepared this little experiment. So what I got here is an 18 volt battery, so two 9 volt batteries, connected to the KA7812 voltage regulator. So this is a typical regulator from the 78 series, and it can output 12 volts. And I also added a small load, so 4.7 kilo ohms, and the capacitors that were recommended in the datasheet. So let's see what sort of noise can we measure coming from this thing. So we can see our noise floor, and if we connect the battery to this thing, then we see substantial amount of noise. So this thing is generating noise. Let's now close the lid and see exactly how much. So we seem to be getting around 84 microvolts of RMS noise. Now the datasheet talks about 42 microvolts of noise, but all in all, we're quite close to the actual noise that we see in the datasheet. We might be able to improve on this, but the thing is, for this regulator, we have a datasheet and we know exactly what it's supposed to be generating. On the other hand, if you have a regulator that you know nothing about, say you build your own regulator, or you find something a bit more exotic and rare, like this KMP403EN4A Soviet 12 volt 1.5 amp regulator that doesn't really have proper datasheet available, you have no idea how much noise it's generating. So this will be one of the things that we can do with this little amplifier, is to see just how well made this piece of Soviet engineering is compared to this puny capitalist regulator. I mean, this one is much bigger, so most definitely it will be better. But let's just measure it and see exactly. And for that, I got this little setup here. So what I've done is I added the same 4.7 kilo ohm load resistor to the output of the stabilizer. I added the recommended output capacitance. And if we turn it on, we see that there is quite a bit of output noise. Now if we add the lid, it mostly stays the same. But all in all, it has roughly 40 something, 50 microvolts of RMS noise. So it's actually better than the KA7812. Now this IC has quite an interesting feature. 
So if we go to its datasheet, so this is the most proper datasheet I found, we have its internal schematic and we see we have pin 5, the adjust pin. And this pin is normally used to fine tune the output voltage. So this is directly connected into the output feedback register divider. Now if I were to take a 470 nanofarad capacitor from this adjust pin to the output, something quite interesting happens. We see that most of the output noise has vanished. So if I remove the capacitor, it comes back up. So by connecting this capacitor, we can have quite a big influence on the output noise. It doesn't affect the output voltage, but it most probably has an effect on some other parameter of the regulator, maybe it's stability or something else, but that's a story for a different time. For now, we can conclude that having this sort of low noise amplifier in your laboratory can be quite a useful tool. I mean, this is the type of measurement that you couldn't possibly do without this circuit. Is it perfect? No. There's things to improve on it, of course. You can decrease its noise floor, you could maybe add a gain switch or something, but even as it is, it's quite a useful tool. So let me know in the comments if you want to see me work on this thing in the future. But for now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.